thank you for um, listening to the, my talk on trials and tribulations in ocular melanoma. My name is Dr. Professor Anthony Joshua from the King Horn Cancer Centre in Convictions Hospital in Sydney, Australia. So the outline of the talk today is that we'll cover what are clinical trials, phase one, two, and three. How do we know if we're achieving anything um, in um, uveal melanoma? What are the different types of treatments for uveal melanoma? We'll talk about a little directed targeted therapy and immunotherapy and give some examples. So there are different types of clinical trials that all patients need to be aware of. Um, and I'll just run through these briefly. Um, firstly, we have things called phase one clinical trials, which are generally phase new drugs, which haven't been given to human beings before, or new drugs in combination, or sometimes even old drugs in combination that haven't been given before, where we're concentrating on finding the right dose of the drug and understanding the safety of giving the drugs together. Um, these trials often um, are small and put on only a small number of patients at any one given time, sometimes are global, so that each, to the extent that only one patient um, in every continent may be able to go on a clinical trial at any one, any one time. And there's frequent blood tests involved in these studies and sometimes compulsory biopsies. So um, these trials do not involve drugs that generally have a strong track record and the doctors are still learning about how to deliver the drugs and how to maximize their efficacy. In a phase two clinical trial, uh, once the do is a trial where the dose has been established and, there's the, and there is some good idea about um, the activity of the drug and we need to do more safety evaluations and a more refined understanding of the drug and how well it works. Um, these phase two trials can either be what we call single arm, which means everyone gets the drug, or occasionally they can be randomized between two different types of treatments. Um, these, that's less so uh, in the current era, but still um, it can be, um, uh, can be um, made available. Sometimes these phase two clinical trials also involve a biomarker that is a certain gene or protein in the, in the cancer that may make the drug work better. And the patients may be selected out to, um, after an initial biopsy to go on a trial where there's a greater degree of suspicion the drug may work because the required gene to make the drug work is in that um, type of cancer. Finally, a phase three clinical trial involves hundreds of patients, which is a comparison to a standard of care. Um, and there usually is randomization, which may involve sometimes even a placebo or a control arm. And these sorts of trials generally are what's needed for FDA, EMA, and TGA approval. Finally, and perhaps less so again, less so in uveal melanoma, we have phase four clinical trials, which involve hundreds of thousands of patients. And are generally post-marketing trials with emphasis on long-term safety and efficacy. And sometimes these types of trials are mandated by the FDA. So patients with uveal melanoma may get involved in any type of these trials. Generally speaking, the earlier phase trials are the more common ones um, as we're still developing drugs um, for uveal melanoma. There are certainly some ups and downs of participating in a clinical trial. Um, you get access to, patients get access to a new drug. Sometimes uh, the patients may get a personalized uh, nurse to help uh, guide them through the trial. Uh, the trial protocol, which is how to give the trial drug, is very, has been very well thought through and generally provides high quality care for patients on that clinical trial. And generally speaking, trials uh, may cover travel costs uh, for patients and drug costs uh, so the patients don't come to any financial harm. But there are some, there are some downsides of participating in a clinical trial. Uh, sometimes you have to wait for the clinical trial. Uh, that clinical trial could be quite inflexible if there's other things that you want to do. Um, even travel. There's certainly effort needed to understand the trial, the rationale. Uh, the trial can have an effect on the family in, in terms of the time it's spent away from the family. And there may be some concerns about randomization and privacy, which are also very important. You can find out more about clinical trials by certainly asking your doctor to see what's available and accessing both patient advocates as well as information on the internet at um, clinical um, trials sites and registries, some of which are listed here which can give you information predominantly about trials in the United States, clinicaltrials.gov in the EU, or in Australia and New Zealand. When we develop drugs as oncologists, and certainly what I counsel my patients about is it's a very long process from lab to clinic, and this process can fail at every step. The models we have for uveal melanoma may not be accurate in predicting efficacy, nor in predicting toxicity. 
the approvals uh, are also difficult to predict. We don't know when drugs will be approved, and sometimes they're approved in one country but not the other. Sometimes we need, don't even know what, what, where's the right place to begin in terms of how active does the drug have to be. For part of that reason, uh, all the um, doctors a few years ago who ran ocular melanoma trials got together and created this uh, landmark piece of scientific research, which put all the patients together who are on clinical trials over the last 20 odd years to see if we could understand how well the drugs worked and what benchmark would we have to beat to suggest the drug had activity. Eventually we got 912 patients with ocular melanoma that participated on clinical trials and we um, broke them down into different types of treatment. They had the different, different types of tumors they had, how big those tumors were. And we created <coughs> curves like this, which tell us um, uh, basically either how long it took for the melanoma to grow, that's called progression-free survival, or overall survival, which is how long the patients live for. And we can look at these curves and predict um, on average, how many patients, what percentage of patients were alive after 12 or 24 months, and what percentage of patients, for example, had the tumours remained stable after 12 or 23, 24 months. Um, we also uh, looked at the different types of treatment and what effect they had on the patients in terms of the time for the melanoma to grow, as well as the time for the patients to live longer. And you can see here that it did appear that patients who had liver-directed therapies did slightly better than the rest of the population. Although when we looked into that a little bit deeper, it was clear that patients who had liver-directed therapies were generally healthier um, and, and had smaller tumors than the other patient populations. So this wasn't probably not a real effect. We looked at what were predictors of success um, and uh, in terms of how long patients were living with ocular melanoma. And we can see here that patients that are what we call ECOG zero um, did better, that, that is patients that are completely healthy, younger patients did better, females did better, patients that had a, a normal level of a blood test called LVH did better, patients that had a normal level of another blood test called ALP did better, and patients that had smaller tumours, again, did better, most of which is fairly intuitive um, and um, will uh, certainly play a role in helping us to understand how future treatments um, play out. So how do we treat ocular melanoma? You can probably understand from those graphs um, the basis of it, either with liver-directed therapies, immunotherapies, targeted therapies, or perhaps other emerging treatments, not to give an exhaustive list. And I've been asked to give some examples of clinical trials which are running, which illustrate some of these points. So um, one of the things we do know about ocular melanoma is they often have a mutation in one of two genes, one called gene AQ and another called gene A11. And this acts as a driver, if you like, an engine to help the melanoma grow. And if we had a way of blocking that activity, then I'm sure we'd have a very profound effect on the melanoma, but unfortunately we don't. So um, what drug companies and doctors have resorted to is trying to block some of the downstream effects, like putting the handbrake up on a speeding car, if you like, with different drugs alone or in combination. I'll just highlight two combinations which are a, of drugs which are currently running. One involves a drug blocking this gene here called MEC, together with either a drug which blocks this gene here called PKC, or a drug which blocks a gene here called FAK. So it is hoped that by blocking these downstream effects in two places, we'll have greater efficacy than just blocking uh, one gene. We can see what happened here when we blocked one gene. This is a drug called a PKC inhibitor, specifically a drug called LXS196, and you can see here there was some tumors that shrunk, but not many of them shrunk below that 30% shrinkage, which is what we like to see. Um, so partly as a result of that, this drug is now being, as I mentioned, given in combination with another drug, which may help it work better. And that here's that clinical trial, um, which is now open in nine sites around the world, eight in the US, in the United States, one in Australia, and this is from that website called clinicaltrials.gov. It helps you find out where trials are running and what cities. And you can, put, you can search by a disease or a drug and see what's available. The other type of trial that I, was asked, that it was, I mentioned was one involving the um, FAK gene together with a, a MEK inhibitor gene. And this trial is running in eight um, cancer centers around the world, four in the United States and three outside the United States. And this trial is exploring 
how safely to combine those two drugs um, to see if you can get um, better efficacy against the melanoma than just one drug by itself, based on some fairly good um, laboratory data. So what does the future hold? We're certainly awaiting um, the results of the Tabentafast clinical trial, which was a trial that uh, tested a type of immunotherapy for uveal melanoma, known as an INTAC. Um, if this trial is successful, and uh, hopefully we'll know soon, although no one's quite sure exactly when, um, this may lead to FDA approval and be the first type of treatment specifically for uveal melanoma approved by the FDA. There are a lot more targeted therapy um, types of trials being explored, and it's almost every month we get a new scientific paper outlining a new target. Most recently, a drug called NRP1 um, was uh, discovered to be important in ocular melanoma. There's also some new immunotherapy combinations with um, one type of immunotherapy that might be important for uveal melanoma is a, is a type of immunotherapy called a LAG3 um, drug. So hopefully these things alone or in combination uh, may lead to great breakthroughs for the treatment of ocular melanoma in the not too distant future. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to address this important symposium on the critically important subject of uveal melanoma. I really would like to thank the Melanoma Research Foundation and in particular Leanna Benefit for her great patience with me this week. And I would also like to thank the local advocacy group, um, uh, Ocumel Ireland, Joanne Finnegan, and all of the other wonderful patients, relatives, and advocates who've come together to make this meeting possible. Honestly, this really is about the patients and about trying to make your treatment better. My name is John Crown. I'm a medical oncologist at St. Vincent's University Hospital in Dublin. I've also been very involved over many years in cancer research. Um, I am the uh, Professor of Translational Cancer Research in Dublin City University, and I'm Professor of Medical Oncology in University College Dublin. My talk today will really focus on translational research opportunities, and translational research really refers to um, uh, the interface between what happens with the lab and what happens in the clinic at the bedside with patients. Um, for many years, uh, we only had chemotherapy to treat our cancer patients. I'm old enough to remember when all we had to offer most patients was chemotherapy. For patients with a small number of diseases, it worked incredibly well, but for, for many diseases, it did not. Uh, it also was a very inelegant treatment, a difficult treatment, a sometimes dangerous treatment, which could cause severe side effects. But I'm so glad that I've lived during a time, during an era, when cancer treatment has undergone an extraordinary transformation is not the word, it's a revolution. We dreamed for many years of having what we call targeted treatments, treatments which would only focus in on the molecular abnormalities in the cancer cell, leaving the rest of the patient largely undisturbed in terms of side effects. We also had a, a little twinkle in our eye that maybe some days uh, all of that lengthy research in immunology would actually give us improved immune therapies for cancer. But starting off with chemotherapy in uveal melanoma, giving ordinary chemotherapy the usual way by vein or by tablets, I'm afraid does not work very well in uveal melanoma. For most patients, it produces little, if any, benefit. In truth, there are important exceptions to that. And I've seen some patients that have had, you know, decent results with it, where they've had good disease shrinkage, improvement in quality of life, and apparently prolonged survival. But for most patients, it's a treatment which does not offer a great deal, I'm afraid. But the idea of giving large doses of chemotherapy to where the disease is, leaving the rest of the patient alone, uh, is what has inspired this idea of chemosaturation. This is a form of treatment where the liver, which as most of many of you will know, in patients who develop secondary or metastatic uvula melanoma, the liver is, is predominantly the target where it goes to. So if it's possible to give very large doses of chemotherapy to the liver and to nowhere else, it might be possible to give a bigger dose where the cancer is and not so much to the other tissues where you're just trying to avoid side effects. And by isolating the liver's blood supply, both the blood going into the liver and the blood coming out of the liver, it's possible to do this. Now, we do not have this treatment available to us in Ireland at the moment, and I'm very grateful to my colleagues in Southampton in England, especially Dr. Matthew Weeder, who does make this treatment available for our Irish patients uh, when it is considered uh, an appropriate treatment for them. 
the treatment clearly has uh, activity for patients whose disease is present in the liver. This particular study done by Dr. Hughes from the US National Cancer Institute and colleagues in other, in other centers showed that here in the yellow, this is the duration of what's called hepatic progression-free survival. This is how those patients stayed well in terms of their liver cancer, their secondary cancer in the liver not getting worse. And as you can see, it was longer for those who got the chemotherapy into the liver than it was in the blue line here, which was for patients who got more traditional approaches. Disappointingly, as you can see here, it had limited, if any, impact on overall survival, i.e. how long patients lived. So while this is, I think, still a treatment which has a role and has a place, and, and for patients whose disease is confined to the liver, various forms of liver-directed therapy are probably better than much of what we've had by way of systemic treatment, and it's clear that there's still a great way to go uh, with this problem. I'm showing this slide. This is not a patient with metastatic uveal melanoma. This is a patient with breast cancer. And I'm, I, I'm sorry for showing this slide, but I, I just think it's important to realize what we hope we can achieve someday. This was a lady who came to me in the year 2000. And this is all her liver. This is a CT scan. This is the front. This is the back. This is the right. This is the left. All of this area here is her liver. And all of the dark stuff is cancer. As you can guess, this lady was very sick. She was going to be one of the first people in Ireland to get a drug called Herceptin on a particular clinical trial. Um, there was a problem getting the drug delivered to Ireland at the time, and by the time it arrived, her liver was failing and she could no longer join the study. The company, however, let me give it to her anyway. And this is her picture five years later. Liver is now normal, no cancer. And this was the lady seven years after that in the nice pink top. And she still remains alive and well, and she's now off treatment. Now, the reason I'm showing this is this shows you the power of a targeted therapy. When we knew that some breast cancers had a target called the HER2 amplification, we were able to develop a drug, and the brilliant work of Dr. Dennis Lehman in UCLA really led to this taking place. We were able to get greatly improved treatments for this condition. Similarly with melanoma of the skin, which is a different disease to uveal melanoma, this is a survival curve for patients who got the old chemotherapy drug, DTIC, which was the, the backbone, I'm afraid, of what we gave both for skin melanoma and for uveal melanoma. And this is the outcome, which as you can see is strikingly better for patients who got a drug called vemurafenib. And this is again, a molecularly targeted drug. And for the minority of patients who have what's called a BRAF mutation in their melanoma, if they get this drug, they get a much better outcome than patients who got chemotherapy. Now, there are some targeted drugs which are being looked at in uveal melanoma as well. Uh, one that had a great deal of airplay a few years ago is one called selumetinib, a little bit disappointing. There are some others that are still the subject of investigation, uh, and certainly uh, I would personally like to see us having some molecular drugs, targeted drugs, which have real activity in this disease. What about immunotherapy? Immunotherapy of cancer is an old idea. This is Dr. Paul Ehrlich, who uh, approximately 120 years ago suggested that maybe we would someday be able to develop immune system type magic bullet treatments, which would attack cancer and leave the patient undisturbed. And uh, a young man who was a surgeon in Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York at the beginning of the 20th century, William Coley, had the radical idea of treating some patients with cancer by heating blood products from patients that had overwhelming infections, such as a, a very serious skin infection called erysipelas, and then infusing that into cancer patients. And he found that some patients' cancers actually regressed. And really, over the last 100, 110 years, there have always been a few patients who got some benefit from the old and primitive immune therapies that we had. But again, they were very inconsistent, uh, a low level of activity for most patients. But this all changed in recent years. One could argue that a short summary of all of immunotherapy and cancer owes something to the cartoon character Pogo. Pogo said, we have met the enemy and he is us. And for many years, many of us and me, mea culpa, one of them, felt that immune therapies were basically up a dead end. And the reason that they were was that the evolution had evolved our immune system to deal with foreign invaders. And the reason we got cancer and the reason our immune system didn't deal with cancer because the body did not recognize it as foreign. It was us, the enemy was us ourselves. It was our own cells going rogue. And it was the extraordinary discovery by these gentlemen, um, Dr. 
um, uh, Hanjo and Dr. Jim Allison, which led to the winning the Nobel Prize about two years ago, that there in fact was a great potential in the immune system to recognize cancer as foreign, but that cancers were protected from the immune system by things called checkpoints. And these checkpoints were put in the immune system by nature to stop all of us from having immune system diseases like arthritis and colitis. And my word for skin melanoma, they have been absolutely transformative. These are survival curves for patients getting one or other of a number of combinations of immune system treatment, showing that coming out, and we know now past five years, for patients with overtly secondary skin melanoma, patients who are in a terrible situation, approximately one half are still alive at five years, whereas five years survival would have been really anecdotal prior to that. What about uvular melanoma? Again, I stress these are different diseases, but um, immune therapies have worked across a wide range of cancers. Would they work in uvular melanoma? Well, one of the reasons for thinking that they may not work that well is that one of the determinants of immune system drugs working in cancer is what's called the mutational burden or mutational density. The more abnormal a cancer cell is, the more the body has the ability to recognize it as being something which shouldn't be there, the higher the chance that the immune system will also recognize it and will attack it. Uvula melanoma has a relatively low number of mutations. So as we can see, this was never going to be as easy a disease to treat as some of the more spectacularly successful treatments with immune therapy. But it has been done. And there was a recent update uh, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology of a paper which was first presented last year at the American Society of Clinical Oncology, looking at the combination of really what is the gold standard immune system treatment, ipilimumab and nivolumab as a doublet dual treatment for patients with metastatic uvular melanoma. And what it basically showed was an overall response of about 17%. About one in six patients had a major shrinkage of their cancer. And about another one half of them had the disease stabilized for a period of time. Uh, at, at, uh, overall, survival was 83 weeks and the one-year survival was 62%. These were very similar to data that had been presented a little earlier from the same drugs in the study in Spain. This is formidable treatment with a high uh, level of treatment-related side effects. And as you can see here on that study, the overall survival, interesting, some patients still alive and well at two and three years. And the really key thing with this will be to see with longer follow-up, are some patients actually having very prolonged survival, a phenomenon we've seen across a range of cancers when immune system treatments are given. Here in the St. Vincent's Hospital group and our colleagues in the Royal Victoria Eye and Ear Hospital, we have over the years treated approximately 39 patients with the new immune system drugs, either single agent ipilimumab, single agent anti-PD-1, such as nivolumab or pembrolizumab, or the two drugs given sometimes together and sometimes in sequence. Now, the reason that this looks a little bit disorganized had to do with our access to the drugs. Uh, we had in the early years, very hit and miss access to these drugs for our patients with uh, uveal melanoma and other cancers. We had ipilimumab first, and when we only had ipilimumab, we tried it. As the other drugs became available, we had some patients who got ipilimumab and then got nivolumab, but now our standard of care for all except for patients in whom we think side effects would be um, too uh, alarming is to give the doublet combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab. And what we have found is that for patients who've had the two drugs in our hands, the average survival is now getting close to two years, which we'd like it much better. But I do think that these drugs are worth trying. And it's interesting if you look at some of the um, uh, uh, compendia of recommendations for the treatment of cancers now, uh, double immunotherapy with these two drugs is now being suggested as probably possibly the treatment of first choice for metastatic uveal melanoma. So what are we trying to do in St. Vincent's? Well, we're trying to build on the immune therapy program um, by uh, developing uh, some novel approaches to immune therapy. We have a long track record in a hospital of doing immune therapy for a number of cancers, and we're particularly keen on doing translational studies, which will enable uh, us to try and see if we can, uh, I'll, excuse me for one second, that was someone trying to call me, uh, to see if we can actually improve on it. We are already the national center in Ireland for liver surgery. So we have quite a track record of sending patients with uveal melanoma for liver resections. And we've had several patients who've had relatively prolonged survival. Again, this does not give permanent cure, but it is probably a treatment which is worth considering for patients who have uh, 
smaller amounts of operable liver disease. But we are trying to develop our liver-directed therapy program, attracting uh, molecular trials as well if we can, and continuing to do translational research. But the real interest for us are the group of patients who are exceptional responders. We have a group of patients who got immunotherapy uh, who have now lived for more than five years. And we have their, with their, their, their great consent, these wonderfully brave patients, uh, we have access to tissues taken from them and we're studying these and comparing the characteristics of these cancers and the characteristics of these patients to patients who have had uh, less impressive degrees of response to see if we can actually determine what are the predictors of who might do better with immune therapy and, and in truth might we actually learn tricks which might enable us to improve the treatment for the others. Um, our uveal melanoma patients will also be part of another large study called GenderNet which is looking at um, gender differences which have been documented in, in toxicity uh, with immune therapies and again trying to work out if we can get uh, some further insight uh, into um, the treatments effects in different patients. That's my last slide. If you haven't read this book and you want to read and learn about cancer, I warmly recommend it. It's a few years old now. It was written by Dr. Siddharatha Mukherjee, who was a young oncologist at the time. Uh, it's a book aimed at a lay audience, but I must say I learned from this book and it explains much of what's going on in cancer research and where we are with current approaches to the disease. I'd like to say special thanks to Kathy Durkin. Kathy was a young lady who had metastatic uvula melanoma and who sadly uh, was lost at a tragically young age, uh, lost to her lovely family with this disease, very bravely uh, went public, became an advocate for improved access to immune and other treatments for patients with this disease. Um, and uh, we do think of her all the time as we're doing our research. A special big thanks to my laboratory and other colleagues um, I'm just showing this uh, slide is outlining some of the expertise which exists in genomics, molecular therapeutics, and immunotherapy within our group. And all of these bright young doctors, prof now Professor Naomi Walsh, Dr. Alex Eustace, and Dr. Dennis Collins are all giving increasing amounts of their time uh, and effort uh, and their brain trust to trying to improve the treatment for uveal melanoma. Again, thank you all very much for your attention. It's been a great pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marcus Butler. I am a medical oncologist at Princess Margaret Cancer Center, and I treat patients with uh, melanoma, with immunotherapy, and other treatments. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, briefly the concept of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, a type of therapy that has shown promising results in patients with uh, uveal melanoma. The uh, tumor microenvironment of uh, patients with uh, cancer is a very complex uh, microenvironment. It includes many types of cells, not just the tumor itself, but many uh, cells that are either fighting the cancer, or also other cells that may be helping the cancer uh, uh, survive and exist. This includes blood vessels uh, that help to feed uh, nutrients to the tumor. It also includes lymphocytes, uh, many of which may be trying to fight against a foreign invader. It turns out that in uh, patients with various types of cancers, this uh, infiltrating lymphocytes that are trying to fight the cancer can often uh, successfully uh, uh, eliminate cancers uh, in, in patients. Also, with new immunotherapies, the immune checkpoint blocking agents, you can see elimination of tumors, which is shown here in this uh, tumor at the top, where there is uh, infiltrating lymphocytes and then giving anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 drugs can result in uh, significant responses against the cancer. For tumors like uveal melanoma, uh, there are uh, infiltrating lymphocytes and other cells but the immune response uh, after uh, treatment with anti-PD-1 and uh, drugs is not as robust, so that the response rate is quite low in the 5% range. So therefore, seven patients require additional treatments uh, with uh, drugs to try to help uh, build upon the responses of anti-PD-1 drugs. Uh, many of you are aware of combination immunotherapy where anti-CTLA-4 drugs like ipilimumab are combined with anti-PD-1 drugs like nivolumab 
which results in a, a substantial response uh, in some patients. But unfortunately, in uveal melanoma, the response rate is measured in the uh, 10 to 15 percent range. Additional experimental combinations are ongoing, and those studies are, are uh, being uh, assessed for uh, promising results in, in patients. And additionally, the other strategies look at ways to induce an anti-cancer response or to expand a, a meager uh, anti-tumor response. This involves vaccinations or engineered cell therapies where patients receive treatments or expanding tumor, infiltrate, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes as a therapy. So cell therapies can be divided up into three different types. And I think that's important uh, in a TIL talk to just uh, mention these briefly. One is the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte uh, strategy, which I'll go over in more detail in a minute. But essentially, the starting material is the tumor. These, uh, this tumor mass, usually you need about at least a centimeter uh, cubic uh, amount of tumor for, for expansion, is grown in the laboratory where the T cells uh, destroy and overpopulate the tumor cells in the mass. And then you have a pure population of lymphocytes that are used for an infusion in patients. Other strategies take T cells from the blood which are then selectively expanded using various methods for infusion as a treatment, or engineered products such as a TCR or CAR T cells, where a genetic engineering program is, is uh, conducted in order to modify the lymphocyte who then is infused into patients as a treatment. So we're gonna review tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Again, the way uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte products are generally generated is as follows. First, a tumor sample is resected from the patient. Those uh, tumor samples are then uh, either uh, digested into a single cell suspension or into little uh, fragments that are then plated into wells in the laboratory. These are then grown in the laboratory with a cytokine called IL-2, where the T cells that are present in the tumor overpopulate and destroy the tumor in the cultures. A second step, which includes a 14-day rapid expansion protocol, is conducted where large numbers of T cells are generated for infusion. In order for the patient to accept the T cells and for the T cells or the TIL, to really have a robust response and persist, patients must first have their uh, uh, lymphodepleting chemotherapy uh, performed. This includes drugs like cyclophosphamide and fludarabine, where space is made for the T cells to uh, then be infused and then expand and, and attack the tumor. The T cells, as I mentioned, are large numbers that are uh, 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 infused, and then IL-2 injections or infusions are given uh, to help the T cells uh, um, uh, expand in the patient. So this whole process is a lengthy one. The uh, pre-rep uh, assessment or generating the, the TIL product takes between two and four weeks. There are some quality control measures that are then taken. And then the REP itself, the rapid expansion protocol, takes another four weeks. Patients usually receive the chemotherapy about a week before the T-cell infusion. T-cells are then given. And then the IL-2 injections are given over uh, a week or so uh, following the uh, T-cell infusion. A major uh, uh, study that was published in 2017 was conducted at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, this study showed that for patients with uveal melanoma, we see about a 35% response rate. And this included patients who had checkpoint refractory uh, 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 uveal melanoma. So these were patients who had previously not received any immunotherapy uh, with checkpoint inhibitors, but went on to the, uh, uh, that's the blue ones where they then received TIL 
and the, the red ones are the patients who had previously received immune checkpoint inhib uh, inhibitors. For many of these patients, the responses were durable. As you can see here, this red line where the tumor has shrunk and then continues to shrink for greater than uh, 21 weeks. Several other patients experienced um, uh, responses that were ongoing at the time of uh, this publication. There were other patients that had brief responses and then further growth, as well as patients with stable disease. So what this meant is that there was a high response rate, 35%, in a group of patients which are very challenging uh, to treat uh, uh, with uh, uh, therapies. Three of the seven patients who had previously had immunotherapy and progressed on it had responses, or three of the seven responses were patients who had had prior checkpoint blockade. Six of the 27 patients, however, that were taking part in the study were not able to be uh, treated due to insufficient till uh, generation. One of the interesting things of the uh, uh, study that was published in 2017 was that the patients who had the most reactive tumor infiltrating lymphocytes demonstrated in laboratory tests showed uh, better responses compared to the other patients. Our own experience with melanoma TILs has, is a similar, has similar results. We conducted a study uh, in the last uh, uh, number of years, starting in 2013, where uh, patients, including one patient with uveal melanoma, uh, were treated with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Uh, these were patients who were heavily pretreated. Almost everyone had prior immunotherapy. In that particular study, now this is for all melanoma patients, our uveal patient had stable disease, but we did see responses in cutaneous melanoma in a, a percentage of patients that would be similar to what was seen with the, um, with the uh, uh, study that was done at the N, uh, NIH. In our particular study, we saw uh, examples of patients who had shrinkage of tumor. As you can see here, there's this big mass here that grew prior to uh, till infusion and then substantially shrunk after uh, uh, T-cell infusion. This is a cutaneous melanoma patient previously treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. What we did see, unfortunately, one month later is a new uh, a tumor deposit developed in this patient and that particular patient uh, had a resection of the tumor and we found high PD-1 expression on the tumor. This has resulted in uh, an ongoing study that recently is completed uh, where patients received uh, TIL infusion, where patients, all of which had previously had immune checkpoint inhibitors. These patients uh, uh, received IL-2 and then we initiate anti-PD-1 therapy with a drug called pembrolizumab in order to see whether we can fight against one of the mechanisms of resistance for, for de of developing resistance against uh, uh, TIL therapy. In this particular study, we've had three patients with uveal melanoma. Unfortunately, we did not see a response in these patients, although they had been heavily pretreated uh, before and had uh, all three of these patients had been treated with immunotherapy. But what was, what, what was interesting is that we saw several patients with stable disease that lasted several months. There are other uh, interesting trials that are uh, open uh, in North America. The current uveal melanoma tumor infiltrating lymphocyte protocol is available in Pittsburgh at the Hillman Cancer Center. Uh, and this is the only uh, phase two study which is uh, currently focusing on TIL uh, for patients. There's also a very interesting study at MD Anderson where autologous T cells are directed against a novel antigen called SLC45A2, uh, uh, where these T cells are infused to try to fight against uveal melanoma. And then also at Houston Methodist Hospital associated with Baylor, there is a GD2 CAR T cell protocol, uh, which is targeting patients with GD2 uh, positive cancers 
and that includes uveal melanoma uh, for, for patients. So there is ongoing exciting uh, res, uh, studies uh, that are being conducted with cell therapies. <clears throat> In addition, our center is uh, participating on studies that target cancer testis antigens like NYSA1 and uh, MAJ4. Unfortunately, these are uh, have a low expression uh, for uveal melanoma. This, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our team at uh, Princess Margaret uh, that include Dr. Spripico, Hogue, uh, and, and Dr. Sable, uh, who participated in the uh, uh, uveal melanoma TIL protocols. We currently don't have a TIL protocol open at this time, although a, a follow-up study focusing on uveal melanoma is in the works. Thank you very much. I appreciate your listening. Hello, my name is Brian Marr from Columbia University in New York City, and I'm going to give you an update of the Phase 1b2 open-label trial of AU011, which is a targeted therapy for treatment of choroidal melanoma. I'm a consultant for Aura, Castle Bioscience, and Immunocore. The Aura technology is based on research done at the NIH by John Schiller. It consists of viral-like particles derived from the HPV-type vaccine that targets heparin sulfate proteoglycans that are expressed on tumors. These particles are bound to a photodynamic dye that, when activated by a certain wavelength, cause a destructive effect on the tumor. After intravitreal or suprachoroidal administration, the drug binds to the tumor cells. There, it can be activated by using a laser using the same wavelength, 689 nanometers, as is currently used in normal photodynamic therapy in the eye. The photoactivation of the drug leads to acute tumor cell necrosis. It also has been demonstrated in preclinical studies that this photodynamic damage can lead to the development of neoadjuvants that elicit an immune-related tumor cell death. This effect of tumor necrosis was demonstrated nicely in the orthotopic xenograft model of choroidal melanomas in rabbits, where an increase in the concentration of drug showed increased necrosis within the tumors. The phase 1b-2 study design included the standard dose escalation and expansion design, which was open label. There were eight cohorts with three subjects in each of the single and multiple dose cohorts in the escalation portion. The first expansion, cohort 9, included 12 subjects that received one cycle of treatment which included three weekly administrations on day 1, 8, and 15 of the maximum dose 80 micrograms, each followed by two lasers per session. The second expansion, cohorts 10 through 12, had 21 subjects enrolled, 20 received two cycles of treatment, and a second cycle at week 12, one subject was in the observation cohort. The inclusion criteria included clinically diagnosed choroidal melanoma from 0.5 to 3.4 millimeters in thickness, either with documented growth or key risk factors associated with growth. A total of 57 patients were enrolled. Out of these 57 patients, 32 subjects had documented growth of the lesion prior to study entry. As the study progressed, it was determined that criteria for the future phase three trial would include documented growth greater than 0.3 millimeters within two years, tumor thickness 0.5 to 3 millimeters, and largest base diameter greater than 13 millimeters. There are 22 subjects enrolled in the study that had these characteristics, and these uh, were of special interest given that the documented growth had an effect. The primary objective of the study was safety with a secondary effect 
secondary objective was exploring the efficacy. The safety profile during this study was fairly favorable, showing adverse events mainly in the inflammatory categories, including anterior chamber inflammation, vitreous inflammation, increased intraocular pressure, floaters, and vitreous opacities. These were easily managed by uh, conventional topical or oral um, anti-inflammatories. There were a few cases of severe visual loss in tumors that were specifically subfoveal or juxtapapillary. The preliminary vision results showed high rates of visual preservation. 75% or 43 out of 56 of the treated subject had tumors that would be considered at high risk for vision loss with standard radiotherapy. Our statistics showed about a 91% visual preservation that continued and was durable throughout the follow-up. The tumor control in the phase 1b2 was overall favorable, with tumor control ranging from 55 to 80 percent in the groups tested. If you isolate those that would be eligible for the phase for the proposed phase three study, uh, 74 to 80 percent of those patients had tumor control at last follow-up. If you took the patients that had documented growth prior to the administration of the phase 1b2 trial and looked at the trajectory of growth before and after treatment, you can see in those patients that the growth was arrested and the growth rate plateaued as shown in the graft. This was encouraging showing a, a drug effect on tumor growth. The summary of the results of the Phase 1b study showed that AU011 was well tolerated. Inflammation is manageable and it starts at the tumor and supports the mechanism of action. Steroids can be started after inflammation is, is observed to allow an immune response. Retreatment after 12 months is safe and well tolerated. The tumor control showed statistically significant reduction in tumor growth in subjects that had documented growth. 80% of the phase three eligible subjects uh, at therapeutic regime demonstrated tumor control with up to 12 months of follow-up, follow an average of eight months. Vision pre preservation was demonstrated in over 87% of patients uh, in all subpopulations, including those with high-risk lesions. The majority of subjects had stable visions within five letters of their baseline visual acuity. Up till now, the medication was delivered intravitrally. Currently, exploration of administration of the drug through the sub suprachoroidal space is now being done. In animal models, it could be shown that a suprachoroidal delivery method increased, increased concentration delivered into the subchoroidal space. Using immunohistochemistry with the suprachoroidal delivery method, it was shown that drug does get to the tumor and can be seen in high concentrations within animal models. In animal models, tumor PK was evaluated after suprachoroidal and intravitreal administrations in New Zealand white rabbits. It showed that there were higher concentrations in the suprachoroidal group. And the same model used for the intravitreal injections Rabbits were also treated with the suprachoroidal injections and then treated with laser activation. And compared to controls with using saline, there was a significant response with the suprachoroidal 
administration similar to those or better than those seen with intravitreal administration. In summary, we're excited to see this new technology showing promise for the future and look forward to the results of the phase three trials. I'd like to thank all the other centers that are uh, contributing and thank you for your attention.